So thanks for joining. Uh, this talk, or the title of this talk is Vehicle Security Trends, Implications for the Auto Supplier. Start with a brief intro of myself. Uh, my name is Aaron Guzman. I'm based out in uh, Los Angeles. I head up an automotive and IoT testing team uh, for a company called Aon. Uh, I lead the uh, OWASP IoT project and the Embedded Application Security project. I'll be talking about uh, those projects at 11.55 in uh, Project Showcase. So if you want to hear about some updates and things that we're working on, uh, I think it's Hall G. Um, a couple of things as far as background within uh, uh, automotive space and IoT. Uh, I've helped facilitated the automotive ISAC's first tabletop exercise about two years ago uh, down in Honda in uh, Los Angeles, which is an experience with uh, several of the OEM uh, manufacturers as well as uh, tier one suppliers, basically going through a mock of an, of an incident and how they would respond. Uh, if you've ever interacted with anyone from the automotive space, they don't like to really collaborate too much, so it was definitely eight hours of uh, pulling teeth. Um, outside from that, I uh, published the book, IoT Penetration Testing Cookbook, uh, in uh, November of 2017, and also edited a few uh, IoT security books with Packet Publishing. Uh, outside of that, I love pizza. Uh, I am disappointed that I I packed pizza socks, but I packed two different pizza socks, so I decided to leave them back in my room. Uh, yeah, so outside of that, I uh, have disclosed some, uh, some security research for uh, automotive and IoT products, uh, specifically for Subaru. was able to compromise uh, a Subaru vehicle, add users to the account. Uh, basically, the essential functions of uh, Starlink, Subaru Starlink on uh, you know, unlocking cars and honking horn, flashing lights, things like that. Had some fun. That was uh, a couple years ago now. So enough about me. I'll go through a brief uh, agenda here. We're going to talk about some advancements in the automotive space, uh, talk about suppliers and their uh, development uh, life cycle, go through some uh, research case studies, also, also some field work uh, that we've performed and got hired uh, for uh, suppliers and, and uh, manufacturers as well, and go through some uh, solutions, mitigated, uh, mitigative solutions, uh, and then if we have time, we'll go through questions. So there's some, some major trends going on here uh, within the automotive space. Uh, one is electrification. The other is mobility, mobili mobility as a service, autonomy, self-driving vehicles, and connectivity, all of which are kind of, in a way, uh, dependent on each other. Um, essentially, what the automotive uh, industry is doing is not, not only becoming a product, a product but also technology uh, a, a company filled with services uh, in the way of uh, integrating uh, with not only the vehicle itself, but also third parties, and we'll get to some of those concerns in a bit. But in order for uh, you know, full autonomy, full self-driving cars, you'll have to have uh, full connectivity, uh, perhaps electrification uh, moving forward as well. Uh, the majority of uh, newer vehicles already have uh, some of this functionality uh, as far as connectivity, autonomy, and we'll go through some of the, the levels in a sec. But essentially, th this is what's going on uh, as far as uh, you know, n n new developments. Uh, and I guess, you know, first we'll touch upon connectivity and what's happening in the connectivity space for automotive. Usually, in order to connect a vehicle, uh, you'll have either a uh, telematics control unit or board, uh, and usually you'll have some sort of network connection via LTE. Uh, you could even have it via Wi-Fi. Uh, moving forward, maybe we'll see some 5G, and then we'll really have some uh, uh, you know, autonomous vehicles going out. Um, so with, with connectivity, we have these new uh, kind of alphabet soup uh, acronyms. So you have vehicle to infrastructure, where your car is talking to the infrastructure, vehicle to vehicle, uh, vehicle to pedestrian, vehicle to device, vehicle to grid, and vehicle to everything. Uh, again, these are all requirements for connectivity and vehicles uh, moving forward. Again, uh, you know, vehicle to vehicle is just basically exchanging uh, you know, certain information about traffic, about distance, some metadata, uh, vehicle to infrastructure. Uh, 
similar, uh, similar kind of architecture, except uh, you know, talking to uh, uh, basically infrastructure for uh, roadside units and uh, intelligent traffic systems in the future. Um, so a lot of exciting things going on, uh, but certainly, obviously, you know, expands the attack surface from a security perspective. Uh, with all these uh, acronyms and connectivity requirements, you also have uh, new companies and uh, suppliers who are, who are developing software uh, outside of you know, the traditional OEM manufacturers. So some of these demands, uh, in order for connectivity to actually work, we need, you, need a, you need a vehicle to be cloud connected 24 seven, ability to perform secure over the air updates, not only for the vehicle itself, but also components. And we're seeing this with safety critical components with Tesla, which is a little scary. We now have basically DevOps in vehicles now. It's kind of cool, but kind of scary. Uh, also, uh, similarly with IVI applications, so the head unit applications, uh, now, I guess being pushed down from the manufacturers, uh, they'll, they'll want updates to be on the fly. Uh, so update, updates to your head unit applications are also um, coming down in the future, uh, if not already. I believe some manufacturers already have that in place. Uh, and with connectivity, you have more data, uh, more data that's being shared not only with the manufacturers, suppliers, and the infrastructure in cities, but also third-party services. Uh, in order to, you know, whatever, whatever may be for licensing, which is basically selling that data, uh, another word uh, that's been kind of coined uh, in the industry. They don't like to say, you know, we're selling your, your data. They like to say we're licensing your data. Um, and, of course, not only with, uh, you know, being connected all the time, 24-7, not only with uh, secure up updates, but also they want reliable connections, they want resiliency, some uh, redundancy, and obviously security, uh, meaning, you know, going through secure channels, whether that's end-to-end -end encryption or, or using other means, hopefully not through proprietary protocols, uh, which are being debunked now. So with connectivity, we talked about autonomy. Uh, ADAS is also uh, a, uh, an acronym used, but essentially there's five levels of uh, autonomy. We're currently around uh, level two here, which is you know, the driver assist, the pro pilot assist, the, the lane, uh, lane departure assistance. There are vehicles that are said to be uh, level three. Uh, I think some, uh, one of the newer uh, Audi R8s um, but there's, there's some, some gray areas here with uh, level three, uh, meaning if uh, the vehicle is driving and there is a, there's a, a driver behind the wheel or a vehicle operator, they're supposed to be ready to intervene at any time, but chances are if your car's already self-driving, you're not gonna be engaged. Uh, it's gonna be very difficult, at least to be ready, uh, especially if, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the vehicle isn't, uh, isn't planning for certain situations. Um, so at, every manufacturer already has a level two, uh, you know, uh, a level two uh, autonomy uh, in, their, in their model years. Uh, you know, the, the Fords, the GMs, the uh, Subarus, the, uh, the Toyotas. Uh, I think after 2017 and up is when uh, every vehicle is already equipped with telematic units. So installed, whether you are a subscriber or not, so you gotta think about that, uh, unless you take out that uh, te telematics unit. But uh, it's, said to, it's, it's said that we'll have uh, full autonomy uh, within the next 10 years, if not sooner. Uh, I think there's a huge dependence upon 5G, so uh, some real uh, scary situations, but uh, essentially, uh, there's uh, you know self-driving trucks already uh, in in the field, um, so it's also causing disruption uh, for for the for the economy. So just be mindful of of some of these levels here, and we'll get to some of the concerns in a second here. But essentially, drivers are fading away and now becoming vehicle operators, um, and they're even hiring for vehicle operators, which is crazy. So a uh, quick, uh, quick uh, a graph here from, uh, from Edmund showing uh, the uh, active safety features, basically when the vehicle is taking control of uh, something that will cause uh, safety concerns. 
uh, which is adaptive cruise, uh, blind spot detection, lane departure. Uh, and you can see on the rise, uh, essentially, you know, again, this is only 2017, uh, pretty much, or probably in the 80 to 90% uh, percentile uh, for active safety features uh, with, with newer cars. But uh, what's scary is that we're giving up our, our trust uh, to someone else's code or several thousand peop uh, people's code uh, who are writing the software uh, you know, to, keep, to keep you safe, uh, to keep you happy, convenient. There's even aftermarket autonomy, uh, meaning devices that you can install on your vehicle, cameras, uh, aftermarket, uh, 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 basically wheels that will, again, do some self-driving uh, functions for you, uh, which is really, really sketchy. Uh, but I wanted to share um, a specific uh, quote here from, uh, it's a company called Lane Cruise, and uh, basically they're retrofitting vehicles not only to be connected, but again, have these autonomous features. Uh, so I was scrolling through their page and uh, you know, going through the FAQ and they have, uh, at present in most jurisdictions, level two autonomy is not regulated and hence totally legal. Um, this is why you can buy a luxury car with some of these features built in without any legal implications. So right away, I mean, that's some red flags. Um, and this is just, again, an aftermarket, uh, this is an aftermarket a uh, company uh, that's developing software. People are using this in their vehicles already. Super, super scary. I, I couldn't imagine, you know, this Lane Cruise company, you know, even if it has several hundred uh, employees or developers, uh, I'm sure that there are some flaws, uh, several different types of flaws, but just the thought uh, of, of this code being introduced into vehicles, expanding that, you know, uh, you know older type of vehicle, you know, this El Camino, for example, a 90s, 80s car that's now going to have uh, self-driving capabilities. So, you know, given the example of the startup, uh, startup company, Lane Cruise, uh, you're probably wondering, you know, who's building and innovating in this space? Like, who's responsible for developing the software? And it's just a sea of partnerships, acquisitions, um, and newer types of uh, OEMs who are building self-driving vehicles from the ground up and fleets. Uh, so essentially, uh, you know, loads of Silicon Valley startups who, uh, you know, are proposing perhaps Lane Cruise might be acquired by, uh, you know, a manufacturer at some point. But what's happening is OEMs are essentially turning into, uh, you know, venture capitalists, angel investors, acquiring these companies, uh, partnering with these companies, um, and then working with uh, tier one suppliers. And this graph is purely just the relationships uh, in 2017 uh, for uh, autonomous vehicles and who's partnering with who. Uh, so essentially, everyone's partnering with someone uh, or, or, or perhaps a same uh, supplier. And uh, what a supplier is, well, we'll get to it in a second. So essentially, again, third party companies who are developing the software. It's not the OEM manufacturers who are, are, are developing. Um, you know, all the software, the head units, the in vehicle networks, there's a lot of third parties involved. So the supplier types and roles, uh, if you ever opened up the hood of your car, you'll see several different names uh, of, uh, of, of the product manufacturers. So you'll have uh, the hardware components, uh, which have, you know, the body control, uh, the body control modules, powertrain sensors, uh, your gateways, uh, cryptographic modules, and so forth. But you also have the software components, uh, which is the platform uh, operating system. It could be a QNX, it could be AutoSAR that's being used, it could be an older Microsoft. Uh, but also, there are third-party suppliers who develop drivers and libraries uh, to help connect uh, you know, certain areas of the, of the hardware uh, from the software perspective. And then also the suppliers who develop the IVI applications, the mobile applications, the web applications. You know, it's not, again, it's not these uh, manufacturers who are developing uh, the software. It's the partnering with the supplier, a third party, essentially, uh, in order for this to, to happen, to be pushed out. So a lot of moving parts, right? A lot of, you know, a lot of uh, cooks in the kitchen just for one product. And this is, this, this is similar not only for automotive, but IoT as a whole. Uh, anything really product or embedded related uh, essentially has a similar structure of supply chain and, and development. 
Um, but what's, you know, uh, you know, I don't want to fear monger here or, uh, but just kind of get to gain a perspective, uh, the, the amount of code that's in a vehicle ranges from 100 to 300 million lines of code. Uh, and this is not only just the in-vehicle networks, uh, but also the head units uh, and several other aspects of, of, uh, of a vehicle. There's, there's 40,000 hardware parts, uh, and this data was taken from uh, Toyota. So this is Toyota's uh, estimates. Uh, and think about that there's code and hardware and software and wireless protocols. Essentially, code is everywhere. Um, and you know, folks like us uh, and OWASP are here to help uh, try to gain, uh, you know, uh, insider perspective, not only from an attacker, but also uh, for secure coding. Uh, we, we reviewed an, an IVI application, one application that's a default application on several vehicles, uh, and it was six million lines of code just for a head unit application. This is uh, the client side and server side code, which is crazy, six million lines of code, um, it's absurd. And there's only going to be more code being introduced moving forward, uh, you know, with all the, uh, you know, connectivity requirements, the V2V, V2I, uh, autonomy. Um, so difficult to try and guarantee safety and security with uh, that much code, uh, and especially uh, legacy code and code that perhaps a supplier is developing for not only uh, one manufacturer, but let's say four manufacturers. So again, everything is code. Uh, so this is just an observation here based upon some of the assessments that we've done. Uh, so we've not only done uh, penetration testing assessments, but also maturity reviews for suppliers. Uh, and this could be a, even a supplier coming to us and they're partnering with a third party company, let's say in India, and they want us to uh, review uh, if their SDLC uh, is uh, if there's if basically if they're saying uh, that they're testing, they're doing uh, source code analysis, dynamic, and so forth. Uh, they call us in to verify, uh, kind of do uh, you know uh, align a, a with uh, like like uh, Open SAM, for example, uh, a uh, software assurance maturity model. Um, so we've been engaged with uh, multiple suppliers who are publicly traded companies who have over 300 developers and zero uh, to three cybersecurity professionals, uh, which is amazing to me. Um, and some of the requirements, the job posting requirements, uh, they'll want five to seven years in, in security, they want some engineering experience. Uh, basically, you know, they're asking for the world here, but yet they, they have no one internally to even interpret uh, let's say their uh, source code analysis uh, output, you know, reports and so forth. Um, so if you look through uh, a number of different uh, suppliers' career pages, uh, they're pretty they're pretty entertaining. Uh, but again, shocking that uh, I guess not not super shocking, but uh, that you know the lack of uh, you know security within uh, a safety critical area or critical infrastructure now, uh, you know, moving forward with vehicles, uh, you know, isn't getting much love. But uh, hopefully that'll change moving forward. Uh, I know several manufacturers now have um, internal red teams, uh, which wasn't a thing before. Uh, I think in the last three years, I think the majority of manufacturers do, aside from some Jap Japanese manufacturers. We'll call them out, but. Uh, to run through uh, the software development life uh, supply chain here, uh, essentially you'll start with the OAM who defines the, the specifications for what they need, what they want, whatever, whatever it may be for either a telematics control unit, a head unit, a body control module. Uh, but essentially uh, you'll start with the hardware requirements, you'll have uh, your uh, board support package that could be uh, working with uh, a, a driver, uh, a company like Broadcom or, or whoever else a Bosch, whoever, whoever it could be. You have your downstream suppliers, uh, your software suppliers, essentially people who are developing the code. Your cloud providers, whether it's AWS, whether it's Azure, whether it's their own in-house cloud. Uh, and then you have integrators who work with these suppliers in order to kind of ease that, uh, uh, that transition to a production environment. Um, so then you have you know, several third parties, several different uh, teams involved from around the world, uh, and then for me, you know, looking at uh, kind of uh, uh, the, the overall process 
and uh, from the handoffs from team to team, um, there are several flaws that you can obviously identify, but a number of different third-party code uh, and teams to be targeted. Uh, super simple, we could easily uh, target an open source library uh, or, or a uh, software um, supplier in any of these stages uh, you know, in order to get you know, uh, not only affect, again, I mentioned uh, one, OA, one OAM manufacturer, but several. So a lot going on. Again, very, very similar landscape for uh, IoT devices as well, uh, aside from the integrators. But uh, just imagine this area here branched off into maybe 20 other different suppliers. So not only are, you know, we're having legitimate software suppliers, via, you know, tier, you know, tier one, tier two, tier three, tier three, but now they're expanding this uh, supply chain uh, with third party development services and, you know, basically essentially having cryptocurrency in your vehicle now. How amazing is that or not? Uh, Jaguar just released uh, a program where you'll have uh, a smart wallet in your vehicle that basically uh, it'll report the potholes and uh, flaws in the road. So essentially you're getting paid uh, automatically for your vehicle uh, and also pay using your car uh, for services, whether it's a gas or uh, you know, going for a coffee of some sort. So uh, these services again uh, are a little bit, uh, makes me a little bit nervous. Uh, again, having uh, cryptocurrency here, in cryptocurrency uh, for, for your vehicles. And uh, other manufacturers are also following, following the same trend. Uh, Honda just released uh, their mobile wallet uh, out in uh, CES this past year. Uh, again, integrating with third-party services and the infrastructure of uh, the services being offered by gas stations and restaurants and so forth. Uh, GM has its own marketplace. Uh, you can order, uh, again, you know, Starbucks, get some donuts. My personal favorite is Applebee's. There's no Applebee's here, but uh, one of my favorites. Uh, so this, this app marketplace, um, think of it like an Android uh, Play Store, uh, where essentially, previously, uh, legacy apps, you know, where you didn't have much to choose from. Uh, it was just what, whatever is default and maybe a few others that you can install. Um, but now you have the opportunity to pull down the apps from a marketplace uh, and do some reverse engineering, um, disassembling, and so forth. Um, you know, with the apps in the marketplace, or you can just develop your own uh, third-party app using, uh, you know, their uh, developers program. They supply you with an SDK. They supply you with emulators. They supply you with everything you'll be, you essentially need uh, to get off the ground. So you have folks like you and I uh, who can develop software for your cars. Uh, and some of the, the, the level of access that, the S, that these uh, SDKs have are access to the internal vehicle networks. So you can scrape CAN bus, you can uh, you know, scrape maybe a media network, whatever you want, essentially. Um, so really scary from that perspective. Again, opening up that uh, you know traditional kind of closed off, you know, no network environment, uh, no you know apps, you know that probably never get updated on your head unit, to a more dynamic uh, landscape uh, and more open uh, with uh, third-party developers, and and you know, they'll have minimal vetting uh, for developing software and becoming a partner or a supplier, but anyone who is uh, motivated or um, you know, has an, an end goal uh, for compromising a vehicle can easily do it via, uh, you know, uh, their third-party developer uh, portals. Other services like Amazon's Key and Car uh, with Fords and Lincoln basically unlock your car um, for uh, uh, Amazon delivery drivers. So again, not only are you trusting, uh, you know, strangers to enter your vehicle, but we also talked about the, the, the adaptive safety features for your car. Uh, you know, the lane departures and so forth. This is a massive target, right? And it's easy to, to uh, put some attention here uh, just because, you know, again, the many different hands, many different teams, many different services, and it's only going to increase moving forward. And this is already happening, again, in IoT. Uh, anybody here heard of Mirai? 
So it affected the U.S., but also you know, other, other countries around the world, but it took down the internet for a period of time, uh, a couple years back, and essentially what, was, what happened was uh, attackers targeted a certain uh, original design manufacturer, ODM, which is another word for supplier. There's all these different same terms for different uh, industry verticals, uh, but an ODM is essentially uh, a supplier. Uh, so they targeted Zhang Mai, and Zhang Mai basically created uh, essentially the, the, the embedded Linux platform that then was built upon, uh, built upon for uh, you know, custom resellers or custom uh, OEM manufacturers to, to use. And there were uh, you know, default Talnet credentials and uh, command injections and so forth. Um, but not only Zhang Mai, you also have um, you know, Blueborn, you have Crack, you have uh, Meltdown Spectre which are all you know, third-party software that's installed in safety-critical functions in a vehicle and even IoT devices. And there's more examples, but uh, it's already happening. Uh, also something to keep in mind is the difficulty of, of updating these, these, uh, these devices. Um, so not only in IoT, but also in just general uh, software. Uh, you know, there's nation state, nation state or even uh, uh, malicious groups out there who are targeting the supply chain. I believe there's even a talk on supply chain uh, today as well, uh, probably more towards JavaScript because that's also a mess. Um, but uh, essentially, you know, we have these groups here focusing on uh, installing or actually developing uh, backdoors and injecting those into, uh, you know, let's say like Asus, for example, who was affected by, by this group, as well as uh, CCleaner. Uh, you know, where, where there was backdoors and uh, basically compromising one of the suppliers in order to gain full uh, rem uh, uh, control, remote code execution. And this is just, you know, not too long ago. So, you, so uh, I did talk a little bit about updating or lack thereof, but essentially a vehicle uh, has a life cycle of, uh, or a lifespan of seven to 15 years. A traditional vehicle this is changing moving forward, but uh, you know, a, a vehicle could be you know, vulnerable for a long period of time or may not ever be updated. Maybe there isn't an over-the-air update solution uh, for certain model years, which has happened uh, for several manufacturers. Well, they'll send uh, a USB stick for you to uh, install an update. Won't speak in that in detail, but probably better solutions. Uh, so, you know, again, you have all this third-party code uh, applications and services that can potentially be, can, can leave you vulnerable uh, for an extended period of time. So some, some case studies here that's happened within the last year, year and a half. Uh, there was some work done by uh, a, uh, a research firm or security firm uh, where they shopped around for uh, vehicles to uh, remotely exploit flaws. And what they chose uh, were vehicles that had a large attack surface, uh, that being uh, the Volkswagen Golf and Audi. They essentially use the same head unit, uh, again, because the same supplier. They're also part of the same company. Uh, but they discovered some uh, vulnerabilities within the Wi-Fi hotspot uh, and essentially gained remote code execution uh, in several different ways. Uh, one of them was via a service in, in Talnet. Um, as well as uh, gaining access to a certain area of the vehicle where you can send arbitrary CAN, uh, CAN messages to the CAN bus. Um, but what they did was they stopped there. Uh, they didn't release technical details because the vehicle, those vehicles do not have update functionality and they felt that they would leave those vehicles at, ri at risk. Um, and some of the suppliers there to note are Bla is BlackBerry QNX and NVIDIA. And here's the, uh, the head unit that got root on the head unit. QNX Neutrino is a common uh, operating system or platform used for head units. Uh, probably there's automotive grade Linux and QNX are probably the, the major uh, platforms that are being used today. Um, but essentially manufacturers are partnering with uh, BlackBerry uh, in order for them to, to provide that platform security and updates um, yeah, in order to keep you know, the head unit as well as the, the safety of a vehicle uh, kind of in order. Uh, so there was some uh, research with uh, BMW uh, last year as well by Tencent Labs, who absolutely tore uh, these BMWs apart. Several, several different models were affected. 
Uh, but essentially what they did uh, was exploit uh, multiple QNX systems uh, that were used by uh, the head unit and obtained, uh, again, remote code execution after fuzzing not only the browser, not only uh, the uh, telematics control unit, uh, but even the USB interface had USB to Ethernet. Um, so again, they had, uh, the, uh, they had two QNX systems, they had third-party Bluetooth stack, uh, a custom browser by Harman, again, another, another, another supplier, um, and then uh, the telematic communication box was also another, another supplier and third-party. So I won't spend too much time on this research because I want to get into more details uh, from some of the field work that we've performed. Uh, but just again, to show some examples and case studies of, uh, of uh, research firms or even attackers uh, focusing in on suppliers and again, how that affects not only multiple vehicles for a same manufacturer, but also uh, a number of different manufacturers. In this case, uh, there was the uh, Tesla key fob research. Anybody heard about this? Sweet. Um, cool, yeah, so uh, there is uh, the Tesla Model S uh, essentially was using uh, a Pectron uh, key fob system uh, where the, uh, the uh, research company uh, was able to defeat some of the wireless uh, encryption here, and they were able to generate uh, key codes and essentially obtain a vehicle, steal a vehicle indefinitely, not just you know, the previous security research of obtaining key codes, a number of them to start, open up the car, stop, uh, and potentially start again. Now they, they uh, created, um, or had the capability using, uh, you know, I think $500 worth of hardware, uh, using a Yardstick One, Proxmark, Raspberry Pi, Rainbow Tables. Proxmark's already like three, or $400, so probably $1,000. But essentially it's possible. Uh, and this same key fob system was used in McLarens, which are really expensive cars, uh, as well as motorcycles, Triumph. It's so really interesting to think about, uh, you know, as an attacker, right? You want the highest impact uh, and something that'll get the company's attention. Uh, and again, focusing in on uh, a supplier is definitely uh, the, the route to go. So some uh, 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 field work that we performed, um, give an example here for an IVI application, or we perform multiple IVI application assessments. Uh, and this was a default uh, application that's installed on several vehicles. Um, and uh, the platform, um, it wasn't only the default application on the IVI, but it also had a companion mobile app. So some of these have hybrid environments where it's connected to a vehicle, it has uh, some functionality and perhaps shares some internet connectivity uh, through, that, through a mobile device. Um, but in this case, uh, or one of the cases here, uh, was six million lines of code, again, for the client side and server side uh, uh, code base. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was very difficult to get uh, all the code from uh, the supplier uh, in order to compile, in order for us to do proper source code analysis. Um, and uh, they didn't really know all the third-party libraries that they had. Uh, so for us, that was already a light bulb uh, that we're going to find some pretty big, uh, pretty big issues, um, you know, during the assessment. So, we, so this assessment was a gray box. So we had not only the source code, access to the developers, uh, but also performed dynamic testing. Very, very helpful, probably the most effective way to do uh, security assessments. Uh, but what we found uh, was loads and loads of dead code, unused code, commented code, with uh, API keys, with uh, essentially uh, user account credentials, uh, database passwords, uh, hard-coded, uh, not only the credentials, but the API endpoints, uh, which gave us uh, an easy way to get access to uh, the admin interfaces of, uh, of these applications. I'll get to that in a second. Um, and again, in this case, uh, what they were doing is licensing data scraped from the canvas. And I'm not sure if they had these agreements with the, the OEMs. Uh, I think they just have the access and they're like, hey, yeah, we're gonna do what we want because we have access. Um, <laughs> so. These IVI applications are not only talking to the OEM's uh, cloud infrastructure. Uh, you know, some OEMs require end-to-end -end, uh, encryption, but it's also talking to their own cloud infrastructure, uh, third-party cloud. And you can imagine, that's, this is only one application um, in this case. Uh, and again, you know, that data being uh, shared in multiple layers, multiple services, multiple companies. 
Uh, but with uh, you know identifying some of the hard coded uh, application servers uh, on, on server side infrastructure, uh, these uh, application servers did not even have uh, authentication. Um, we were able to get remote code execution on these servers. We were able to upload our own application servers. Uh, some of the, uh, uh, the pages that we found were uh, status pages that have the ability to dump memory uh, from the application servers. Um, so essentially the basics of security, uh, security principles and cleanliness uh, were, were not there. What they heavily de depended on was the OEM to go and do their own security assessment for, uh, for their application. Uh, but essentially, it's like a unit test where it's a bunch of check boxes, and if the features you know, are what, what they agreed upon, then uh, that's like the bare minimum. Uh, if they require TLS, that's all they're going to put is TLS. They're not going to uh, ensure that they're doing output encoding, and they're not going to uh, do some input validation. Uh, it, it's a really, really interesting case. Um, but uh, once the application was running, uh, it was even uh, logging uh, the API keys, the user uh, uh, basically coordinates, uh, the data from the CAN bus that it was scraping. Uh, essentially everything it could, it was logged to the console. In this case, they we're using a head unit that was Android based, so Logcat. Super, super simple. Um, to acquire that data. And if you've ever, I don't know if anyone's, has anyone done forensics on an automotive telematics unit or a head unit? Lo loads of data, I, I better speed up here. Uh, loads of data there. Um, here's an example. This is what they were doing. Uh, again, uh, logging the API key, secret, uh, request paths, all to the console, uh, doing basically dynamic, <laughs> Uh, 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 arbitrary code uh, formation here in Java using uh, actually C, uh, C and C++. Uh, encrypting, uh, I'm sorry, logging, again, the VIN uh, and all the kind of safety critical functions as well, uh, and even logging usernames and passwords. So really, really basic things that there was just, you know, wasn't on, on top of their heads. Um, longitude, latitude. Here's that application server. Uh, with the threads here, you can click on any of these, dump the memory, see what's going on with what vehicle around the world. Because this supplier not only developed company, uh, developed software for uh, for the U.S., but also Canada, China, South America. Um, again, this had no authentication. And here's the uh, application server that had default credentials, of course, and uh, a legacy uh, Apache Access server where we were able to get code execution. So. You know, very little effort, um, unfortunately. And what we did was we used standard methodologies and tool sets. There wasn't anything crazy that we did out of the ordinary. Uh, we leveraged the uh, application security verification standard, the, the mobile one as well, the OWASP top tens, uh, not only for, for the web, but uh, mobile and IoT. Uh, you know, we, we, did, we did source code analysis using commercial and free tools, uh, listed a few tools that we used. Mobile Security Framework, uh, which is a great tool if anyone's uh, used it before. But was what was really the key was manually reviewing the code and working with the dev teams. Uh, all this, all the, the dead and commented out code is not going to be flagged uh, too much by, by tools. Uh, it's going to be informational at best. Uh, so you know, in, in, in those uh, comments, we also found GitHub credentials. Crazy. Crazy, crazy stuff. Um, so we also do a, a, a product assessment for fleet management companies. They're tier one suppliers that uh, essentially develop products that plug into commercial trucks um, and uh, passenger vehicles as well uh, via OBD2. Uh, in this case, it wasn't as simple. It didn't have much of, a, of an attack surface. It was using uh, a bare metal. There wasn't an embedded Linux or so real-time operating system. Uh, but we got lucky, and by sniffing uh, hardware communication, uh, via Syria, we were able to obtain firmware over the, over the air uh, credentials and pull over uh, 7,000 uh, vehicle details about maintenance, about uh, you know, the drivers, about um, essentially you know, critical details for uh, this commercial company, Tier 1 Supplier. Um, but again, th this is also retrofitting cars that aren't uh, made to be connected. And uh, again, you're exposing all that data now uh, by pulling that data, and then uh, not only for managing fleets and monitoring uh, driver riskiness uh, in this case, but uh, licensing as well. 
Uh, and uh, for case number two here, for a fleet management supplier, uh, in this case it was an IoT gateway, and this is, we did multiple of these, where it had Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, uh, LTE, uh, has cameras, and basically drivers connect to the hotspot, and uh, the, the sensors around the vehicle connect to the hotspot. Uh, and we were able to uh, obtain uh, code execution um, by having uh, a, a live uh, serial connection, but uh, essentially what we did was, was expose uh, or exploit uh, open source components. Uh, it was using Fastboot, which is an Android-based uh, bootloader, and it had debug functionality to stack trace. Uh, we were able to get uh, code execution by uh, essentially using uh, ARM assembly to uh, then give us uh, a sh a shell access by putting in our SSH credentials. Okay, let me close it out. Uh, just some example code here uh, that we used. Um, essentially, the, the bin SH here uh, is what we used to get code execution, uh, mounted uh, the file systems, able to, to input our user, and then get root at the end of the day. Uh, another finding, we were able to bypass secure boot by using a malicious NTP server, pushing down to an exp uh, expiry date that uh, wouldn't be recognized. Uh, we found that this is a problem with all embedded uh, devices, essentially finding a trusted source of time. Uh, interesting problem. Uh, let me run through these really quick. I know we're out of time. Uh, again, the suppliers are, are reliant upon OEMs uh, to perform you know, security initiatives and testing. Uh, there's lack of security culture, personnel, and, and folks who understand uh, security within uh, uh, supplier companies, uh, so especially when you have these startups uh, and newer types of uh, products that are being developed by uh, you know, Silicon Valley companies. Um, and essentially writing software that had not been exposed to the internet previously. Again, we talk about these uh, client-side credentials uh, and uh, you know, secrets that you know, would not normally you know, be internet-facing and, and now is. And uh, you know, lack of transparency through the supply chain. Uh, essentially, you know, black box binaries are given to OEM manufacturers and that are being compiled into uh, their head units or uh, whatever the product may be. Uh, you know, your supply, their suppliers essentially have their own suppliers. Uh, so this kind of trickles down. Think about kind of the, the, uh, the JavaScript uh, supply chain issues. Uh, so we'll wrap up with uh, some technical guidance here or at least some mitigation uh, measures. Uh, there are several different uh, best practices uh, to bolster up security programs for automotive companies. Uh, there's a new standard being released uh, in 2020, it's ISO standard, that's going to uh, work with OEMs and tier one suppliers, which is promising. Uh, essentially, it's, it's going to show their due diligence for security, uh, which right now, it's a mess. There isn't a standard for cybersecurity in the automotive space, uh, so everyone's using their own frameworks. Uh, which you can imagine is like, you know, developing your own crypto. Okay, guys. Just need to wrap up. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to find me. I'll be in the, uh, the project showcase. And uh, thank you for your time. Appreciate it.